Hi, welcome to this uh, special Q&A recording of Inconvenient Indian, one of the 50 official selection titles at the 45th Toronto International Film Festival. This film plays as part of TIFF Docs, which is generously sponsored by A&E Indie Films. Uh, as part of Share Her Journey, TIFF's commitment to supporting women women behind and in front of the camera, we're thrilled to spotlight the incredible films by women at this year's festival, including Michelle Latimer, the director of Inconvenient Indian. Uh, my name is Steve Gravestock, and I'm a senior senior international programmer. I'm thrilled to be here with uh, director Michelle Latimer and producer Jesse Wente. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us. As an organization still impacted by COVID, we need the support of our audiences so that we can continue to present films to future generations and preserve these diverse and important voices. Uh, I want to remind you guys, this is... Uh, uh, if you could, uh, this film is eligible for the People's Choice Award, a vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. And it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, director Michelle Latimer and producer Jesse Wente. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi, Steve. Uh, so I thought, uh, 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 congrats on the film. Uh, it's an amazing piece of work. Uh, we're thrilled to be screening it uh, virtually and in person, and in this case, virtually. Uh, um, uh, I thought maybe we'd talk about uh, how the how the process of adapting the book uh, happened, uh, how that developed, uh, um, uh, how, how, how you guys got together as a team. Uh, Jesse, do you want to maybe start or? Uh, sure. Um, the book had actually been in development for more than a year, I think, before I came on board as a producer in 2017. Um, and I think that Stuart uh, Henderson, who's not with us, one of the other producers with me, um, you know, they had had the rights to the book for that period and had really struggled, I think, to figure out how to uh, adapt it and how to get it off the ground. Um, I think my first instinct, uh, Steve, was to admit that you really couldn't adapt the book, um, at least like page for page or, or, or literally, because um, the book is, is so dense with history that to think that you could do it in a 90 minute film was probably just too daunting for us producers to even imagine. Um, and so I think we sort of rather quickly decided, well, we weren't gonna be able to adapt the book if anything what we wanted to do was be inspired or or take the book's ideas and and bring them forward and that's when for me it became apparent that the best person uh to do that was going to be michelle latimer and and if i if i say steve like my contribution as a producer really to this project was occurred in the first week that i was on the on the project when i said you know who we should hire michelle latimer and that was it Cool, uh, Michelle. Do you want to talk about? Uh, 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 do you want to look back on how that developed? I mean, yeah, I, I we should. Uh, I mean, maybe talk about how you approach the uh, adaptation because it's it's quite un It's I think it's very a very unique approach to the the book. Well, I will say that um, that's like throughout this process, I have uh, looked to Jesse many times for his advice and um, thoughts about things. So uh, I think he's being a little humble when he says that his biggest contribution was hiring me. But um, but I think, uh, yeah, I just basically the way I approached it was um, uh, breaking it down into themes and um, almost like the way I would approach when I'm in the post-production edit phase of a film, I like put all my scenes and I card them. I did that with the book, but I looked thematically and then brainstormed what could be visualizations of these ideas that would support the themes that are in the book. And then it became a distillation, really, an editorial process of breaking that down. It took me about three treatments to get to the place that the film is at now. I originally thought that we would focus on um, some photographs that Thomas King had done um, throughout his travels. But then as I sort of did a deep dive into his work, uh, reading his other books, listening again to his Massey lectures, looking at his children's books, that kind of brought me closer to the Coyote story um, that kind of is a spine for the film. And I would say that, um, yeah, I basically, I really, there were parts in the book that I knew I just needed to have in the film. And so those were, those to this day remain, which is sort of interesting because 
at the very beginning when you have an idea, you it's usually almost like overwritten or overthought and then it's always like bringing it back down to like the essence of what that idea is and it's interesting that the parts of the book that resonated most for me continue today to be the parts that are in the film cool yeah do you want what what led you to the uh uh using the coyote story as the uh, as as a sort of it's sort of the spine or the backbone of the film yeah, I mean, I feel like Thomas King's humor and wit, he is a bit of a trickster in, his, in the way he presents things. He presents them with this sort of funny, like, lead you in only to, like, suck and punch you once he's got you, you know? And and I felt like there's a the trickster being this character that, like, reflects humanity back, and it's sometimes a cautionary tale. And I felt like that was the perfect sort of um, hero or, or, or character to sort of walk with Thomas on his journey. And then... Um, and also the parable of the coyote and the duck story being a larger sort of metaphor for um, land extraction, land taking, um, and, and just settler colonialism as a whole, you know? Um, and then of course, Miss Chief, Kent's alter ego, Miss Chief, Eagle Testicles, also kind of like a trickster character. So by the end of the film, them being uh, Thomas King being flanked by these two sort of gender bending tricksters um, is also sort of a uh, tip your hat to um, gender and sexuality before uh, colonization. I would also the, say, I, I, did, as, I, I would also say, so sorry, Steve, that I mean, I think that that coyote story, and I think why it was so okay. clever of Michelle to use the coyote story was that we needed a cinematic device to link the ideas of Tom together. And if you remember in the book, Tom as a literary device uses his wife really to help link and, and sort of um, almost, almost challenge him sometimes or, or, and I, we couldn't use uh, Tom's uh, wife uh, in the movie. Uh, and so we, I think that was one of the struggles was try to find that that connective tissue for the ideas that we wanted um, to present, but that would give us a, a bit of a playfulness. And in this case, I think Michelle really did a great job in seizing on another piece of Tom's work in order to 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 do that. And I think it's really that's what adaptation is about: is figuring out how to make something that's literary into something that's cinematic. Yeah, one of my well, I, I, go, ahead. go ahead. One of my big, um, one of my favorite adaptations of all time is *Naked Lunch* by uh, that Cronenberg adapted. And I remember when I read that novel, being like, "How? How would you adapt this?" And for me, that's the true spirit of adaptation: is that it's not a literal cinematic sort of uh, extortion of what the book is. It's it's an actual jumping off point that has these creative, circular kind of ways about. Um, expressing what the book had expressed, you know. I, 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 one of the things that really struck me uh, about the film version is that, uh, um, you know, uh, much a, a lot of what you, you, you a lot of what you use in terms of Tom's voiceover is direct from the uh, is direct from the book. But the uh, uh, there's also the, those elements, uh, uh, sort of n newer elements that you uh, that are that are specific to the to the film, like the the interviews with um, uh, cultural figures. Um, like Alethea, Kent Monkman, um, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're very compelling in terms of looking at contemporary cultural practices in terms of, uh, um, you, you know, following some of uh, King's sort of ideas about uh, re-examining history uh, or re-examining a North American European colonial version of history. And they really dovetail nicely with those ideas as well as the, uh, uh, your focus on reviving those traditional, uh, you look at people who are reviving uh, those traditional cultural practices like, uh, like hunting or tattooing in, in, in like in terms of uh, uh, Alethea or her first short, but also people who are sort of using uh, those like genre uh, techniques that are, uh, to, to tell a different story like in the section on Slashback and, and Neela. Do you want to comment a bit about that? I mean, I really think it's a stellar, uh, aspect of the film. Do you mean like commenting on how I came to those people or do you mean like how? Yeah, and, how and how, I mean, it's just really, uh, uh, it's really, 
it really does expand on the book and sort of uh, uh, bring it into a, a very precise contemporary point as well, I think. And how, you, and how you came to those people as well, I think. Well, I think sometimes when we hear about the kinds of indigenous stories that hit the news and it's often, you know, um, stories of resistance and, and, and those are, are really important to be expressed. But I think sometimes we don't hear about these cultural revitalized, like uh, this revitalization of cultural practices like tattooing. Um, you know, that's a, a great example. Or there's been a lot of um, sort of issues around like uh, activism around like, oh no, we shouldn't have seal hunting, that kind of thing. But I think when we place it in a framework of these are like ancestral knowledge that is actually a it, it's not just a practice in itself, it's also about a relationship to land, where you're from, your history, your ancestors, then that that has a greater weight. And I think we miss that context a lot when we when we just like look at something that's just issue based, you know, and, and especially when you think of seal hunting, there's an emotional attachment that people have when they don't understand the context behind that. I showed up in Nunavut, I walked into the grocery store, half the watermelon was twenty dollars. I mean, so when you do that and you realize that most kids, over half 50% of children go to school maybe with only having one meal that day in that community, um, you realize the importance of hunters within that community. And that context is often missing. And I think it's really hard to judge without understanding. Um, and so I, that was part of this process, was trying to show another side of it, another point of view that would help elicit not only understanding, but empathy. And, um, and for us to really question, as the audience to really question, what are the conscious and unconscious biases we have when we look at these practices? Jesse, do you want to add anything or? Uh, okay. uh, uh, sure, I mean, I'll add, a, I'll add a couple of things. I mean, for me, the, the thing that I would always mention to Michelle and my fellow producers was, um, you know, the, the word inconvenient and the idea of what inconvenience is and why and how Thomas sees and understands the inconvenience of indigenous existence. And I always just wanted to, to make sure we were all, to me, the ultimate sign of us being inconvenient is when we just live as ourselves and when we live as we have. So to me, the hunting scene, that's the height of inconvenience for colonial states is an indigenous person living exactly as they have for millennia. And that is the most inconvenient we could possibly be, even beyond protesting and getting in the way of colonialism, is actually just denying it by continuing to exist as we always have, is really powerful. And I would say the, the, um, the other thing around the characters is I, you know, the book is more than 10 years old. And so even as we came to approach it, so much has happened since the publication, the initial publication of the book, and when we were getting to produce the picture, that it felt like we needed to update the ideas or, or at least set it in the now. And so that was part of why I think we, Michelle, really looked towards getting other voices who were very much living the way, the way Tom had written in the book, who were very much engaging and enacting. Um, uh, his ideas, and we got a real gift, Steve. The, on the first meeting, we went to where Michelle, we were introducing Michelle to, to Thomas. We went to his home in Guelph, and we were in his kitchen, and he has in a really impressive kitchen and dining room, and he makes these remarkable coffees. And it was then that he told us, we did not know this beforehand, that he was updating the book that there was going to be a new version of the book, which was the illustrated version, which I pointed out to him would have been useful before we started production on the movie, an illustrated version of the book. But besides that, um, he had done a new uh, sort of afterward tour to the book that did um, bring his ideas into the moment, very much in response to the notion of reconciliation, which was barely a thing when he wrote the original book and I we all sat around his table and read this afterward and I think we all looked at each other me Stuart and Michelle and we're like Eureka the afterward is where the movie starts like that's the actual beginning is is Thomas bringing this up 
to date. And so the movie that you you watch is I to me very much our response Michelle I think to reading that afterward and having that moment of like that's it that's now we see the entry point the contemporary entry point to Thomas's work. Yeah, and I would say too with that illustrated version it was um it really was a breakthrough for me. I rewrote the treatment after seeing the illustrated version of the book and that became the treatment that the Film based on, and part of that was also thinking about the history of images and the media and that relationship that the media um, has had and documentation has had to indigenous people through for hundreds of years since the beginning of cinema. And I and it, and it really made me think about that historic. If you were to lay out images to be a history, what would those images look like? And we went through everything from set land settlement farming posters to you know. Um, you know, to obviously the horrible imagery we've seen coming out of residential schools, you know, but all of that imagery collectively kind of helped um, support the film. Oh, I, uh, I, I missed, uh, we had a bit of a glitch there. I didn't catch that last bit, but uh, the, uh, I think we, um, we can maybe do one more question because we were, uh, at our uh, at, at our time limit, you talked about. Uh, I want to talk about the visual uh, strategies too, because I think you often start one of the really interesting things. I think actually, maybe the the visual strategies, but also I, I love the fact that you didn't. Uh, you know, documentaries often kind of announce who their subjects are, and and you you didn't do that in, in the film. Like you you take people, which I thought was a really kind of you did at the at the end, but it, I thought it was a really interesting way to introduce people because you know some people, but I didn't obviously know who the 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 guy doing the hunting was or uh, you know that kind of thing. Do you want to talk about that strategy? And one more thing, I just wanted. Sorry, I guess this is a three-part question. Uh, hiding is a single question, but whatever. Uh, yeah, I, those the photographs in the fox. Those are Tom Thomas King's photos. I, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, if you could talk about those. That, um, uh, yeah. So any of those three or okay. so uh, the photographs from Thomas King are um, originally I thought that uh, Thomas has taken photos throughout his travels and he is a, a beautiful photographer and actually you can see a bunch of his photographs posted on his website and those photographs were in some of those were in the illustrated version but Thomas also showed us a lot of his photographs and I thought that we ended up sort of moving away from using the photographs as a uh, we and, and we moved away from them and grounded the film in the coyote story, but I still wanted to use the photographs. So that's why they are representative of being sort of snippets of people's lives and of people's histories as you walk into the cinema. This idea of we're inviting you into a story and it's a collective story, but it's rooted in the different individuals you'll see, you know? And, and obviously there's a lot of layering in that imagery. You have like the Lone Ranger mask on an uh, American Indian movement um, activist. You have Tom King's son standing there with, you know, um, the Redskins jerseys on. And I think that these are all, you know, it's just like a little peppering of the things we're going to dive into when we go into the film, when we move into the theater with Thomas and sit down and start to see our story reflected back at us. Um, in terms of the visualization, and in terms of like not not representing the characters, I would just say that for many, many years, I programmed at the Hot Dogs Film Festival. And I watched a lot of documentaries in that process. And something that I was continually coming up against was this idea of the expert interview and how the experts or the academics would be privileged in a way in this hierarchical kind of concept of like they had enough information to be the ones to like be the authority on this subject. And I just found that problematic when I wanted to tell a collective story about indigenous people across Turtle Island. And in a way, yes, Tom is sort of the conductor of the orchestra, but it's it's an orchestra where many voices come to tell one larger story. And for me, it was so important to not think privilege who the people are, but the idea of what they're saying, and then recognize who they are after the fact. And also, like you have famous people like Kent Muckman, and then you have a hunter like Stephen Lonsdale, who doesn't nobody would know he's not he's not um famous in that way although he is a, he's central to his community and so i wanted to also for us to come up and think about those ideas those labels we put on people cool well i uh thanks so much for spending time with us thanks so much for the film uh it's an amazing piece of work uh, really seminal and uh 
Um, if people don't get a chance to see it at the festival, I hope they track it down uh, afterwards or recommend it to people. And please remember to vote. And thanks, guys. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve.